Et maintenant, je déclare Euro Disney officiellement ouvert. In 1992, under the leadership of Michael Eisner as CEO and Frank Wells as COO, Disney would open its most ambitious park at that time. Located right outside of Paris and originally known as Euro Disneyland, this park was meant to be the start of a new Disney resort that would serve to entice visitors from all over Europe. It modeled itself on Walt's original Disneyland, but went above and beyond, striving to be an extravagant park rich with detail and putting all of the previous Disney parks to shame. Yet, for such an incredibly ambitious and certainly expensive park, it failed. It failed to understand its audience, treating Europeans as a single unified culture, rather than a varied collection of countries with different consumer behavior. It failed to understand that it was located in France, refusing to serve alcohol when wine is a staple of the French diet. It also failed to understand that by misjudging Europe, it appeared as a loud and boisterous declaration of American consumerism, acting as the ultimate exercise in cultural imperialism and invading France of all places. On opening day, Euro Disney saw rather disappointing attendance numbers as the park filled up to about 25,000 people, much less than the expected 90,000. The park would continue to struggle and was perceived as a huge financial headache, changing the course of how Disney would tackle new parks and attractions in the future. As a genuinely creative CEO, Michael Eisner was responsible for not just greenlighting many of the classic attractions that we know today, but liked to be involved heavily in the creative process. Still, he was always tethered to financial reality by Frank Wells. Yet, with the failure of Euro Disneyland, and with the passing of Wells in a helicopter accident in 1994, Eisner would continue to make a series of poor decisions that still impact the parks today. While it wasn't all bad, a large degree of attractions and even entire theme parks would premiere with very visible cost-cutting in an effort to be conservative and not overspend, so as not to have a repeat of Euro Disney. There are plenty of examples, such as replacing the well-loved Journey into Imagination with Journey into Your Imagination, or adding capacity to Animal Kingdom with the often hated Chester and Hester's Dino-Rama, taking cheap, off-the-shelf rides, and trying to incorporate them into the kitsch theming of Dinoland. Even full parks would open as sad testaments to the cheap cost-cutting of Disney, often lacking anything other than a handful of inexpensive and barely-themed attractions, such as with Walt Disney Studios Park or Hong Kong Disneyland. Yet, there is one park that has come to symbolize the fall of Eisner more visibly than any other. That park would of course be Disney California Adventure, which would open in 2001, expanding Disneyland into a resort that also included a shopping district called Downtown Disney, and a new hotel called Disney's Grand California. California Adventure existed as a showcase of the cost-cutting era of Eisner, opening with far more shopping and dining than attractions, and looking rather cheap in execution. Of the rides that did exist within the park, many were off the shelf and inexpensive, existing to pad park maps rather than shooting for the exceptional slate of experiences that Disney was known for. Worse still, why would Disney build a park themed to California in California? Well, here's the thing. I believe that with the right effort and financial backing, California Adventure could have opened as one of Disney's best parks. Given the right attention, we could have had a park that people praised for its ingenious theming, citing the overall California theme as an unusual but unique example of the strengths of Disney Imagineering. Yet, the park that opened in 2001 was an absolute train wreck that squandered so much potential. From there, the question arises though. Could California Adventure be fixed right from the start? stopping it from transforming into the IP mess that it is today? I think that the answer is certainly yes, and today I would like to explore the original California Adventure Park, taking a look at its original attractions and concepts, proposing fixes for what could have potentially been one of Disney's greatest parks.
As Walt Disney World continued to expand with the opening of Disney MGM Studios in 1989, ideas began to surface in an effort to turn Disneyland into a multi-day destination and resort. Taking inspiration from Epcot, Disney planned to turn the Disneyland parking lot into a new and ambitious park called Westcott Center, hoping to evolve the ideas of Epcot into a new but unique West Coast version. Anchored by an even larger geodesic sphere covered in gold-colored panels and named Space Station Earth, Westcott would explore themes of science, innovation, and world culture. Yet, this incredibly expensive park was taken off the table after the failure of Euro Disney, instead resulting in a company retreat in 1995, where executives workshopped new ideas for a much cheaper alternative. Reportedly, the idea for California Adventure was proposed by then Disneyland president Paul Pressler, who had a notorious reputation for cutting everything at Disneyland, ranging from staffing to attraction upkeep. Due to the failure of Euro Disney and having a background in retail as he helped launch the Disney Store, Pressler was purposefully brought into Disneyland to slash spending in 1994. Think of him as a smaller scale Bob Chapek, if you will. Being promoted to president of Walt Disney Attractions in 1998, and from there stepping into the role of chairman of Disney Parks and Resorts in 2000, he had a strong hand in the development of Disney California Adventure past just the initial proposal. The idea for the park stemmed from how Walt Disney World acted as one of the largest draws for Florida tourism. Sure, people came to visit the beaches and to party on spring break, but Disney was still one of the largest tourist destinations in the world. Eisner thought that Disneyland had a lot of untapped potential as a major resort in the same vein as Walt Disney World, and so the California-themed park made sense as a draw to the state. Why travel all over California when you could get it all in just one park under the Disney banner? At the very least, if the park couldn't keep people on property exclusively, it could also serve as a romanticized love letter to California's many varied tourist spots and culture, introducing people to the state as their first stop through the lens of Disney Imagineering. Starting from the entrance, it was clear that this park would be quite different, designed to look like a California postcard. Large concrete letters would spell out California, juxtaposed against palm trees and a colorful but tacky ceramic mural meant to represent the geography of the state. Further back, an oddly distorted rendition of the Golden Gate Bridge would work as both an entryway into the park, as well as an overpass through which the Disneyland monorail would travel, which was admittedly pretty cool. However, while I think that the idea for the postcard entrance was actually quite creative, the issue is that it only really worked if you stood in the right place. If not, it was reportedly quite unappealing in its presentation. Walking under the bridge, visitors would notice the tacky and cheap theming that decorated the various stores found in the entrance area, known as the Sunshine Plaza. While some elements were interesting, visitors would also notice the music, which stood in stark contrast to the nostalgic pieces of Main Street USA, as a playlist of pop and rock songs that related to California. The icon for the park, which was a large metallic sun, originated with Space Station Earth. When the original plans for Westcott were announced in 1991, there was a lot of pushback from local Anaheim residents, especially with the ambitious park icon and how visible a large metallic structure would be from their houses. However, as the park concept evolved, and in an effort to appease locals, the park icon would instead become a golden spire. As plans for California Adventure were drawn up, the idea of the golden icon was instead transformed into the large metallic sun, which was intended to be viewed as peeking over the Golden Gate entrance. However, its execution would be less than grand, continuing to be cut down in size through the development process and turning into a rather unappealing structure. It did sit on top of what was called the Wave Fountain, though, intended to invoke ideas of the California surf, which I do think was at least interesting in concept. One of the largest issues with Sunshine Plaza, and really the park in general, was how contemporary it was intended to be. I'm not saying that Disney should always rely on creating lands centered around history and nostalgia, but it is really one of their signature strengths. After Bob Iger became CEO in 2005, one of his goals became to figure out how to fix the blemish of California Adventure, and a $1.1 billion revamp of the park was announced in 2007. 
The entrance was then closed in sections starting in 2010, then restructuring and retheming buildings, while also expanding the park entrance out to where the California letters stood. This new entrance area, now titled Buena Vista Street, is meant to take visitors back in time to 1920s Los Angeles and invoke what it must have felt like when Walt first arrived in California. Where the Sun Icon once stood is a building containing a restaurant called Carthay Circle, based on the now demolished Carthay Circle Theater, which is where Walt's first feature-length film, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, premiered. While I never experienced Sunshine Plaza, I have to say that Buena Vista Street is an excellent addition worthy of the park's theme. It manages to evoke nostalgia that Disney is so well known for, but also really works as a well-detailed land full of callbacks to Walt. For all the criticism I often levy at the park because of how thematically messy it currently is, Buena Vista Street is a truly outstanding rework of the previous entrance plaza. Since the goal of the video is to address whether California Adventure could have been great from the start with the right ideas and investment, this is the perfect example of how it could have been executed right from the beginning. It's not just a celebration of Walt, but brings visitors right into historic California, encompassing and symbolic enough as a theme to work as an introduction to the park's overall message, yet also detailed and distinct, working as an immersive land that's fun to explore. As often as I criticize Iger, I do really enjoy that the land seems to have been conceptualized without the need for IP integration. From both Sunshine Plaza and Buena Vista Street, though, visitors could turn left and enter a land known as the Hollywood Pictures Backlot, existing as one of Disney's worst lands and containing what is arguably their most hated attraction. Unlike Hollywood Boulevard, which evoked the feeling of Golden Age Hollywood in Disney MGM Studios, the Hollywood Pictures backlot of California Adventure was designed as a contemporary parody of Hollywood culture in 2001. The concept behind the land was that it was a backlot set meant to recreate Hollywood, set in Hollywood, which was actually located around 30 miles south of real-life Hollywood. Throughout the land, numerous details would be present, such as the shop window advertising the barbershop, known as Ben Hare, as an allusion to the 1959 MGM historic epic, Ben Hur. Another example would be the sign for the fitness center, known as Dial M for Muscle, again alluding to the classic 1954 film, Dial M for Murder. Still, the land had the issue of making tasteless and more contemporary jokes about the state of 1990s Hollywood. Examples reflecting this would be the odd animal print awnings, or the phallic-shaped sign, advertising the Philip A. Couch Casting Agency, an extremely unfortunate joke referencing incidents of sexual assault during casting auditions. Walking behind the facades of the street, though, it became very clear how Disney was shooting for artificial as the actual theme, where you could literally see the structures holding up the facades like an actual studio backlot. While this worked for Disney MGM Studios, as one of the themes was to take guests behind the scenes of movie making, here, it just feels like a cheap and edgy joke about the artificial nature of Hollywood. Perhaps in another timeline, Disney could have provided interesting commentary on the state of the filmmaking industry, but here it fails spectacularly. The Hollywood Pictures backlot of course included shopping and dining, as well as a number of attractions. One notable dining location was the ABC soap opera Bistro, which allowed people to dine in recreations of sets from All My Children, General Hospital, and One Life to Live. While interesting because of how bizarre it is, I'm not exactly sure who the target audience was intended to be here. Obviously, this aged quite poorly as well. As far as attractions were concerned, Muppet Vision 3D was located in a largely unthemed soundstage behind the facades, which existed as a clone of the Disney MGM version. Another cloned attraction from the same park would be Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, Play It, which was an interactive theme park version of the game show where participants would play for points. Located at the end of the street with a large facade, the Hyperion Theater hosted numerous Broadway-style stage shows, 
most notable of which was Disney's Aladdin, a musical spectacular, which ran from 2003 to 2016. Another attraction would be The Art of Disney Animation, an educational show about how Disney characters are drawn, hosted by Mushu, and allowing visitors to walk around sets inspired by Aladdin and Beauty and the Beast. Yet, what people remember most, and not in a positive light, is Superstar Limo. Originally conceived as a high-speed attraction, the concept put guests into the role of movie stars, taking a limo from LAX and speeding through Hollywood while being chased by the paparazzi, evading them until they reach the Chinese theater where they meet Michael Eisner to sign a movie contract. Due to the recent death of Princess Diana, whose driver crashed while trying to evade the paparazzi in Paris, the idea was scrapped in favor of a rework that parodied 90s Hollywood culture and celebrity icons. This new version of the ride was located behind the street facades, but had its own flat cutout entrance meant to represent the hills of Hollywood. Once inside the queue, visitors would find themselves in the LAX baggage claim, as overhead narration from Joan Rivers announces that Hollywood's newest movie star has just landed, indicating that this was the role of the guests. From here, you board a cab from the airport and encounter a sign stating that all of the LA freeways are jammed. Turning right into a dark traffic tunnel, a screen on the ride vehicle reveals your agent, an absolutely nightmarish gaudy latex puppet who insists they need to make it to the Chinese theater. Emerging from the tunnel, the cab essentially takes riders on a tour through various locations of celebrity Hollywood, really leaning into the reality TV aesthetic. The attraction features a number of C-list celebrities, created in a highly stylized but also revolting art style. There's not really much content to the attraction other than driving through Hollywood and listening to jokes and puns that only really make sense if you followed Hollywood celebrities in the late 90s. Finally, arriving for your premiere at the theater, you're met on the red carpet by Whoopi Goldberg, and from here, the ride essentially ends. While in retrospect, the attraction is interesting because of how bizarre and poorly thought out the concept was, it does live on as a legendary blunder for the company, really working to symbolize the failure of California Adventure's hip and edgy contemporary California theme. With low attendance and pretty vocal hatred, Superstar Limo failed to last even a full year, closing in 2002 and eventually being replaced with Monsters Inc. Mike and Sully to the rescue, opening in 2006. Reusing the same track, this reskin of the attraction is a decent and fun dark ride, but is also quite surreal, reskinning many of the animatronics used in Superstar Limo. Take Drew Carey, for example, being turned into an agent of the CDA. Through the last two decades, the Hollywood Pictures backlot would evolve away from late 90s Hollywood, adding the Twilight Zone Tower of Terror to the end of the street in 2004, which, while inferior to the Disney MGM Studios version, was still a very welcome addition to a park that desperately needed quality attractions. With this, the land slowly replaced many of its signs and store windows, becoming an extension of Buena Vista Street and being renamed to Hollywood Land, thematically turning into a celebration of the golden age of Hollywood, very much in the vein of Disney MGM. While a bit of an IP dumping ground today, as Monsters Inc. makes no sense for the land, and including other attractions like Frozen at the Hyperion, the Disney Junior Dance Party, or Mickey's Filler Magic, at the very least, it's more thematically interesting without the infusion of tabloid celebrity culture, specifically referencing the late 1990s. While also a fun ride, it's unfortunate that the Tower of Terror was rethemed into Guardians of the Galaxy Mission Breakout to tie into Avengers Campus, creating an absolute eyesore for the park skyline whereas it previously made a lot of thematic sense for the Hollywood theming. So, having covered this land, what could have made it great from the start? Well, the solution easily presents itself to me, as one of the original ideas for the land was to create an iteration of the Great Movie Ride. I'm not sure if it would have been a clone of the Disney MGM version, and its lack of inclusion was reportedly due to contract issues with MGM itself. Still, removing the tacky celebrity aspect and instead creating a land that acts as a reverent tribute to historic Hollywood would have been an excellent option, in my opinion. Just as The Great Movie Ride worked as a thesis statement in celebrating cinema for Disney MGM, it too would work well in a somewhat revamped version of the Hollywood Pictures backlot. 
I know that Disney doesn't need to appeal to nostalgia to be successful, but it worked at Disney MGM, and it would certainly work here. Making the land itself a bit more timeless, anchored by an attraction that had already proven itself a classic. If you were standing in Sunshine Plaza and turned right, you would encounter a loop named the Golden State, which acted as an encompassing theme for a number of different minilands that were themed to a variety of California locations. Initially, you could see Grizzly Peak in the center, working as another icon for the park as the mountain shaped to look like the bear from the California state flag. Starting from the bottom and moving south, guests would encounter the Golden Vine Winery, which existed alongside the path, obviously representing California wine country. Here, visitors would find a few quick service locations serving small plates and local California wine, while a small building hosted an educational indoor film called Seasons of the Vine. On the other side of the pathway was the notorious Bountiful Valley Farm, an educational exhibit that focused on the importance of California agriculture and allowed children to climb into a tractor. In addition, Tough to be a Bug was shoehorned into this area, as it was distantly related to using insects to control other pests, much like using wasps in Epcot's greenhouses. While I don't think that the theme is inherently bad, and in fact I actually kind of like it, the farm is often used as an example of how bare bones the park was when it opened. Heading further down the path, visitors would encounter the Pacific Wharf, themed after San Francisco and hosting a number of quick service locations meant to emulate California cuisine. While a bit odd, Pacific Wharf also featured two walkthrough attractions. The first is the Boudin Bakery Tour, which was an educational exhibit focusing on the production of sourdough bread and is still present in the park today. In contrast, the other attraction was another walkthrough known as the Mission Tortilla Factory, which still aimed to be educational and would end by handing out tortilla samples to visitors. Unlike the Bakery Tour though, it closed in 2011, making way for the Ghirardelli Soda Fountain and Chocolate Shop in 2012. Perhaps not too exciting, it's a quaint, well-themed shop that I've taken a liking to. Continuing further on, and about halfway through the loop, guests would now find themselves at a land known as the Bay Area, existing as a small location recreating San Francisco architecture and looking out into the lagoon known as Paradise Bay. The attraction located here was a film called Golden Dreams, housed inside a recreation of San Francisco's Palace of Fine Arts. Originally conceived as an ambitious animatronic show in the spirit of the American adventure, but instead focused on the history of California, it was downgraded to just a film hosted by Whoopi Goldberg. While not a bad attraction by any means, you can see how it's a shell of a much more ambitious idea. It eventually closed in 2008, demolishing the building and opening The Little Mermaid, Ariel's Undersea Adventure there in 2011, which obviously has nothing to do with the park. Continuing around the loop, guests now found themselves in Grizzly Peak, an area designed to emulate the redwood forests of the state. Here, visitors at Disney's Grand Californian would have an alternative entrance to the park, and would come out near Grizzly River Run, a water raft ride that took guests on a perilous adventure upstate. While a scenic and beautifully themed attraction, it suffers by lacking distinct show scenes. Across from this attraction is the Redwood Creek Challenge Trail, which serves as both an educational exhibition on California parks, as well as a climbing and play area where kids can burn off some energy. Finally, finishing out the Golden State Loop is Condor Flats, themed to a desert airfield and hosting the one surprise attraction of the park, Soarin' Over California. Oddly enough, where California Adventure was a park where budget cuts were evident and its attraction lined up padded, Soarin' managed to stand out as incredibly fresh and innovative, providing a beautiful and exciting experience in simulating flights over various locations in California. The attraction was so successful that it was added to the Land Pavilion at Epcot in 2005, which did seem to fit, even if it was California-focused. Today, the Golden State does not exist as a full land anymore, 
with the Golden Vine Winery becoming part of Pacific Wharf, Condor Flats being incorporated into Grizzly Peak, and the Bountiful Valley Farm being expanded and rethemed to Bungsland in 2002, then being demolished and replaced entirely with Avengers Campus in 2021. Finally, the bay was eventually incorporated into the park's final land, Paradise Pier, despite sharing more in common thematically with Pacific Wharf. Before moving on there though, it's clear that the Golden State suffered from some serious issues, namely the lack of attractions. What it did offer though also tended to be underwhelming. Grizzly River Run had the potential to be a great ride, but it desperately needs some distinct scenes to keep it memorable. For example, adding some grizzly bear animatronics into these caves would go a long way in keeping things interesting. Other areas of the attraction, while beautiful and aesthetically pleasing, tend to be rather bare and could have benefited from props or show scenes. I see the occasional tent or kayak, but adding in comical scenes using animatronics of trapped campers could be one way of plussing the attraction. Grizzly River Run is just short of being a truly memorable experience, and I'm surprised with how much it's lacking, as even some simple scenes would really bring it out to a new level. Quickly running back to Soren, it's a great attraction in film, and while it was actually great for the initial park, it has sadly been replaced with Soren Around the World, which clearly was intended to fit in thematically with Epcot. While both films are pretty much equivalent to me, as I recently covered in another video, I slightly prefer the California version and wish it would stick around, as it makes vastly more sense thematically in California Adventure. At the very least, the park seems open to bringing it back for their seasonal food and wine festival, which is better than nothing, I suppose. From the start, the bay would have benefited from the original animatronic show that had been planned for it, and while covering history can certainly be problematic as is showcased by the American Adventure, I can see it being executed tastefully as a standout attraction that the original opening park really needed. Concerning Pacific Wharf and the winery, both areas are small but themed really well, and serve their function in providing an eclectic choice of food options. In my opinion, not much needed to change here, and while people often use the bakery and tortilla tours as examples of shallow attractions, I don't think that would be the case if the rest of the park managed to deliver. One aspect I really liked about the Eisner era is the focus on edutainment, and while not the most exciting of attractions, I do at least respect what they're trying to do, especially since they fit in with the culinary experience of the area. Really, the largest loss of potential is not just with Grizzly River Run, but with Bountiful Valley Farm as well. Again, I like the idea of wanting to educate guests, but Bugs Land was clearly a band-aid fix, incorporating in some lightly themed flat rides for children. Perhaps this may sound a bit dumb, but I would have personally liked to see a small dark ride that focused on the history and development of California agriculture, also tied thematically into wine country. Just off the top of my head, a small ride that had riders boarding suspended crop dusters in a similar ride system to Peter Pan, taking them over the California landscapes and farms, could have been a charming addition with the right budget and creativity. This was never a conceptualized idea to my knowledge, but with the right level of creativity and implementation, I can plausibly see it working as a charming little ride. If Epcot's Living with the Land has managed to become a classic, then I don't see why a more stylized dark ride couldn't either, tying into the theme of the park and educating guests while they're having fun. Heading towards the back of the park was also the largest land, known as Paradise Pier. The area would start in the bay and would wrap around the lagoon, circling back to the Golden State. Filled with shopping, midway games, and mostly flat rides, Paradise Pier was intended to exist as a Disney-fied version of a boardwalk amusement, paying tribute to the amusement parks that helped build the industry. The main draw of this area was the roller coaster called California Screamin', a launch steel coaster manufactured by Intamin, but designed to remind visitors about classic wooden coasters found at boardwalks. Featuring an onboard sound system that synced music with the ride path, 
California Screaming included one inversion where the coaster would loop through a large Mickey as its signature element, but otherwise engineered its intensity perfectly for a Disney park. For a coaster that only features that one single loop, it manages to stand out as quite thrilling, yet not so overwhelming as to drive away the average Disney guest that may not be too acclimated to the more intense elements. It's impressive to me how well-paced the coaster manages to be and is a true standout as one of the funnest experiences of the park. Paradise Pier also included a number of other attractions, most of which worked better as kinetic visual draws than attractions worthy of a Disney park though. For example, the Sun Wheel was designed to emulate Coney Island's Wonder Wheel, which featured both stationary and swinging gondolas. This is the only Ferris wheel I've been on that features the swinging option, but as someone who is rarely intimidated by even the most intense attractions, I can say that the feature is quite unique and incredibly terrifying. Otherwise though, a Ferris wheel is a rather underwhelming option for a Disney park, which carries over to the many other attractions here as well. Paradise Pier contained a swing ride sitting within an orange peel known as the Orange Stinger, which would blast riders with an orange scent as the ride cycled. There was also the Mellow Boomer, a space shot themed to a High Striker Midway game. Towards the west end of Paradise Pier were a few tacky gift shops, and the area also included a few rides, such as the Golden Zephyr and Jumpin' Jellyfish. Around this area was also a loose and half-hearted Route 66 theme, as it also featured a wild mouse coaster known as Mulholland Madness, simulating the feeling of swerving through California traffic. This area would slowly lose its theming, adding in dining locations and retheming the small coaster to Goofy Sky School in 2011. Part of the reason that the theming was dropped was because the park was adding Cars Land, which would then open in 2012. Originally conceptualized as Carland, it would work as a tribute to California car culture of the 1950s and 60s, being set along Route 66. Still, this was the beginning of Iger's obsession with stuffing Disney IP down the throats of park guests, and the idea evolved into Cars Land as we know it today, based on the Pixar film franchise. While Cars Land is really well executed, and its signature attraction Radiator Springs Racers is phenomenal, I still can't get over what a poor fit it is for the park. As I've often repeated through various videos, the town of Radiator Springs, which is featured here, takes place in Ornament Valley, inspired by the real-life Monument Valley located in Arizona. While it's certainly relatively close to California, it still doesn't tie in thematically to the park and fails to contribute to the overall theme. Circling back to Paradise Pier, the land is a bit of a mixed bag. It has often been criticized as being unworthy of a Disney park, as it consists mostly of flat rides and cheap, over-the-top theming. Yet, I will admit that it did execute many of its attractions in a unique way, such as adding the swinging gondolas to the sun wheel, or plussing a swing ride by setting it within an interesting piece of architecture and pumping the orange scent at the riders. Paradise Pier also only loosely fits into the California theme, as while California certainly had its share of boardwalk amusements and midways, the land is clearly inspired most heavily by Coney Island instead, pretending to harken back to a California that never really existed. Still, the standout here is certainly California Screamin', and I think that Paradise Pier could have worked if it lost most of its flat rides, and instead went for something a bit more ambitious. Many of Disneyland's classic Fantasyland dark rides were conceptualized as elevated versions of boardwalk-style dark rides and ghost trains. These were pretty common in the early 20th century, and while usually intended to be scary, I can see how the concept could be evolved to fit Paradise Pier. To address this land before it was even built, the slate of unique flat rides could perhaps be reduced but would also include small show buildings that would include more thematically appropriate and elevated dark rides in the spirit of early boardwalk amusements. These could be themed to anything, but just throwing ideas out there off the top of my head, I think that the pier could include at least three. One would be themed to the Little Mermaid, working appropriately because of the story's relation to the sea, 
and another would continue the theme of early 20th century boardwalk amusement parks, taking riders through a comical ride of crashing into clowns, popcorn stands, and through crowds of visitors. Perhaps even a ghost train would be appropriate, but instead of being scary, would work as a spoof of these kind of cheesy attractions. I think that with some small but solid dark rides in this area, Paradise Pier could have premiered as a strong land from the beginning, while still fitting into the park as thematically appropriate. Still, even with the proposed fixes to the various lands I've covered, the park would still need more attractions. Returning back to Cars Land, I think that the park really should have opened with this land, but instead of the IP tie-in, I'm going to propose using the original ideas. Like Radiator Springs, Carland would be designed as a central strip, as Crew Street would run right down the middle. It would feature a quick service location called Marty's Malt Shop, a car wash serving as a splash pad, an adaptation of the sci-fi dine-in from Disney MGM, and a few other shops themed to classic cars at Route 66. The lands would reportedly contain two attractions, which will be a racing coaster and a more family-oriented ride that may or may not have been a dark ride, taking visitors to various scenes depicting kitschy roadside attractions through well-detailed landscapes, including an homage to the Rainbow Caverns that once existed at Disneyland. Cars Land isn't really that different from this concept though, and I think that essentially keeping it the same but removing the IP would be a recipe for success. Instead of a racing coaster, use the same ride system as Radiator Springs Racers, and instead focus on racing through California. The indoor dark ride scenes could also be comical and bring visitors to various roadside destinations that were originally conceptualized as part of the family attraction. Just to throw another idea out there, I would also like to see a smaller scale dark ride located completely indoors. Visitors would enter a classic car showroom as the queue, before then boarding small vehicles designed to look like those very cars. This slow-moving dark ride would then take visitors through life in this 1950s desert town, again providing a lot of comical scenes relating to the antics of rebellious 1950s teenagers racing their cars and hanging out at diners, watching the reactions of the town residents to all the chaos. I will continue to praise Cars Lane as it exists today, just because it's so ridiculously well executed, but I think that if California Adventure had opened with car lanes from the start and contained quality attractions, it would just be another fix in creating the strong park that it should have been. One of the largest issues with California Adventure wasn't just that it was cheap, but it was also too contemporary. I understand the idea that it was meant as an introduction to California for tourists visiting Disneyland Resort, but I've come to realize that shooting for a romanticized California of the past is a far stronger idea. Buena Vista Street proves how effective this can be, and I realize that many of the fixes that I proposed were already in the works before they got cut, or are otherwise based in history and nostalgia. Doing a quick summary of the fixes that I've already proposed, keeping the Hollywood pictures back lot, but instead opening it as a love letter to classic Golden Age Hollywood would be the way to go. It was proven to be effective at Disney MGM, and keeping the great movie ride, or at least a new interpretation of it in these plans, would have been an excellent anchor attraction. Disney is at its best when its parks are loaded with dark rides, and that's something that California Adventure still actually really needs. I also think that adding the Tower of Terror was a great addition, so while the park didn't open with it, I still propose adding a full version, like a Disney MGM. Concerning the Golden State, Soren is a good start, but I would also propose plussing Grizzly River Run with some animatronic scenes to really put it over the top. Other fixes would include giving Golden Dreams the budget needed to create an ambitious animatronic heavy show, as well as creating a small dark ride in Bountiful Valley Farm to showcase the history and importance of California agriculture. It's an idea that seems fitting for the original Epcot, so I don't see why it couldn't work here. Otherwise, Pacific Wharf and the rest of the Golden State doesn't really need to be changed. The largest changes would instead be made to Paradise Pier, 
Cutting down its flat rides and instead incorporating boardwalk style dark rides meant to pay tribute to the cheap and tacky rides of the past. Whether that be a comical ride through the boardwalk, a rendition of The Little Mermaid, or a spoof ghost train, I think that it would add a lot to the area. I see that when Toy Story Midway Mania was introduced to Paradise Pier in 2008, it did try to fit in with the theme of Boardwalk Midway games despite the IP tie-in, so the idea of paying tribute to historic Boardwalk culture seems fundamentally sound. Last, with all these changes in place, California Adventure should have also opened with a rendition of Carland, paying tribute to California car culture of the 1950s and containing some outstanding attractions. As I already proposed, a non-IP version of Radiator Springs Racers would probably be really popular, as well as a slow-moving dark ride that takes riders through the comical shenanigans of the town late at night. While I don't dislike California Adventure as it exists today, it has very much become an IP dumping ground that has destroyed the overall theme of the park. Replacing Soarin' Over California with Soarin' Around the World breaks the park's thematic integrity once again, and Adventure's campus is a waste of space, poorly shoehorned into the park's overall theme. You can't just say that the Avengers have a superhero campus in California to keep it thematically appropriate. It's obviously just a cheap land built as a backdrop for photo ops and merchandise sales. Continuing forward, Hollywood Land suffers from a lack of attractions, and while I do enjoy how odd Monsters Inc. is, it's still a poor fit. If Disney wanted to use this area to dump their IP, it would have worked if presented as traveling behind the scenes and into the movies themselves, just as Disney MGM did for most of its life. With the right effort, anything can make sense thematically, rather than an out-of-place facade like this. As already discussed, Cars Land is set in Arizona, so it's already a poor fit, and the worst land has to be Pixar Pier. For all of the complaints about the abundance of off-the-shelf attractions and tacky theming, I don't understand why the strategy was to double down on this. Turning California Screamin' into the Incredicoaster, or replacing the Sunwheel icon with a Mickey head didn't work to fix anything, but rather made it tackier. It goes back to the brand problem that I previously discussed, where Iger and Chapek treat their guests like morons who only come to the parks for identifiable IP, rather than the overall park experience and unique attractions that wants to find them. I have to wonder what would have happened if Eisner hadn't spiraled from the fallout of Euro Disney, instead going forward with new ambitious parks in Hong Kong and California Adventure, but really spending the money and effort needed to create an ambitious and excellent experience. If that were the case, we probably wouldn't be having discussions about how overused IP is in the parks currently, and how they work as a crutch for actual interesting attraction design. The original California Adventure could have been a nostalgic throwback to historic California, educating guests but also entertaining them. It was full of so much theming potential, and yet it was conceptualized as a bargain bin version of a theme park, failing to live up to the Disney standard. As stated earlier, with the right level of creativity and budget, California Adventure could have been seen as a genius move from the company, working as a showcase of the best Imagineering had to offer. It's fun to speculate on what the part could have been, and I fully believe that it could have been great right from the start. If you enjoy content like this, I'd like to say that a really easy way to help the channel out is to just quickly hit the like button. As always, if you aren't already subscribed and have hit the bell icon, I strongly encourage you to do that as well.